welcome to stat i'm telling you all medical true crime stories and it gets bizarre karen wickiam yeah she used to work in er and now she's sharing the knowledge so let's get involved hey funny and scary at the same time medical mysteries all facts she ain't lying <laughs> so tune in the stat if you dare because crazy things can happen anytime anywhere <laughs> yeah Hello, 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 everybody out there in podcast land. Welcome to STAT, Shocking Traumas and Treatments. And I am your host, Karen Wickiam, coming to you from beautiful Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Today's show is the Andrea Yates Story Part 2. Where I last left off was on August 18th, 1999, when Dr. Starbranch warned Andrea and Rusty about her getting pregnant again and that she was convinced that Andrea would have another bout of psychotic depression. Today I'm going to start on March 2000 when Andrea was pregnant with her fifth baby Mary. Noah was being homeschooled by Andrea at a kindergarten level while caring for her other three toddlers. Rusty gave Andrea one night a week to get out of the house. Andrea continued to visit Dr. Star Branch monthly. On January the 12th, 2000, during her appointment, she had told Dr. Starbranch that she had been off all her medications as of November 1999 and that she felt okay and she didn't want to be on any medications unless she felt like she was getting sick again. Rusty stated that he didn't like Andrea being unmedicated, but he wasn't going to go against her. There are no further records indicating that Andrea returned to her doctor after the January 12th, 2000 visit. Andrea had a close friend by the name of Debbie Holmes. Andrea had not been able to open up to anyone about how she had felt or why she had tried to kill herself on two other occasions. Feeling a lot better, she told Debbie that she thought she was possessed and that had caused her to have mental illness and breakdowns. She said that she wasn't able to wear the cross that a family member had given her. And she said that she had constant thoughts about wanting to hurt someone most troubling her children. Andrea thought that Satan could read her mind, and it was Michael Warinecki that put that notion in her head. Andrea felt that she just needed to be stronger, and if she was, she could fight Satan and not have a hormonal imbalance. She began to delve deeper and deeper into the Bible, looking for answers, and was getting mixed messages. This is a good time to talk about the influence that Michael Warinecki had on Andrea. I'm going to start off by saying that Everything about Warren Eckie makes me sick. I think he's a sociopathic street preacher who uses the Bible for his own selfish agenda. Michael Warren Eckie was a hit-and-run evangelist who would travel from town to town using a bullhorn to spew fire and brimstone, verbally attacking and mocking anyone who disagreed with them. He would yell at people passing by, insulting them and condemning them, sometimes dragging a life-size crucifix behind him. Warren Yecki, his wife and children, would dress up in costume to perform his interpretation of the sins of the human race to whomever passed by. He was usually asked to leave by store owners and the police. He had racked up dozens upon dozens of the disturbing the peace arrests, fleeing whenever he wore out his welcome. Here's a clip of him preaching, and you can get an idea what he was all about. So going to heaven, it just isn't going to cut it. When you go into the kingdom of God for eternity, you're there forever with Jesus. That's different than just going to heaven. Everybody goes to heaven to be judged. Yeah, and most people are going to be thrown into the lake of fire. Because they hate God. They don't want to obey God. They want to live in sin. They want to masturbate, fornicate, get drunk, party, uh, you hang out with the girls, hang out with the boys, look cool. No, 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 no. I'm telling you that Jesus Christ said it himself. He said, strive to enter in at the straight gate. Emphasis on straight for the, for the sodomites and the homosexuals here in uh, Palo Alto. I cut it short there because I didn't want to inflict his ugly, hateful speech upon you any further. Just so you know, I mean, you can go on the YouTube and find him and listen to his uh, words if you want to. But really moving forward even more so it was about also men dominating women and children in particular being targeted to go to hell because their parents did a poor job of not following michael's words okay so he received his master's degree in divinity in 1980 from fuller theological seminary in pasadena california 
but he is not an ordained minister. He couldn't become one because he was rejected when he tried to get ministries in Africa and India, and he tried to get jobs at many campus ministries. No one wanted him because he was so over the top and aggressive. He does not like being associated with any religion or church because in his mind, it is only him who speaks the truth. He says he speaks directly to Jesus and to God and that he is guided by this. He saw himself as a persecuted prophet. Warnecki did not work and he did not live in a home. He believed that working and living in a house and having a car, etc. was feeding the evil corporate machine. Warren Yeke didn't work in part because he couldn't keep a job. He would preach his warped religious doctrine all day and be insubordinate to his bosses. He preached to living a simple and spare life, but like all hypocrites, he didn't live that way. As you know, Warren Yeke influenced the Yates to live a sparse life. This is why they sold their house and lived in a mobile home. And furthermore, it was Warren Yeke that sold the beat up old Greyhound bus as he told them that the mobile home they were living in was too extravagant. While Rusty and Andrea and their four children were living in relative squalor, this is how the Warnackis lived. They too lived on a bus, but it was a provost 40-foot luxury bus worth about a million dollars, the kind of bus that rock stars travel in. They lived comfortably off the money donated by their followers and credit cards. Michael was very good at shaming and swindling people out of their hard-earned money, but he would admonish them for working on one hand and take their money with the other. Warren Yeke was given a free membership to an exclusive network of recreational campgrounds that provided all the modern amenities. The main thing that Warren Yeke preached was that most of the world would not and would never go to heaven. Well, except for him and his family. And that everyone was bad. There was no redemption unless you followed his words. Believe it or not, he was very persuasive and had followers for short periods of time. Warren Yeke was an arrogant, self-serving individual who used his charisma to get people to follow him, the same people he would run from when things got hot. Rusty met Mike when he was preaching at his school, and as I said before, Rusty liked him right away and befriended him. Shortly after, Rusty introduced Mike and his wife to Andrea. Mike convinced Rusty to buy his favorite book called Hope for the Flowers and Rusty gifted it to Andrea when they first started dating, and later on would read it to the children. This book played a big role in their marriage. Andrea would become obsessed with the words within its pages. It is full of symbolism of the ugly turned beautiful with salvation. Mike and his family were the beautiful butterflies, and everyone else was the ugly caterpillar. As juvenile and silly as it sounds, Andrea saw herself as the ugly caterpillar and wanted to become the beautiful butterfly and save her family. It was the genesis of many of her delusions. She could not make herself or her children into butterflies. Satan possessed her and she had to kill her children to get them into heaven before Satan got them. When Andrea reached out to Michael and Rachel Warnecke for any help or guidance, they would harass and admonish her and told her she was failing as a woman and as a mother. They would throw their twisted interpretations of scripture at her, and for a very sick, psychotic, and delusional woman, this was very dangerous. They didn't kill Andrea's children, but they did fuel her psychosis and bear some responsibility. Of course, Michael Warren Yeke denied this when questioned by police and reporters, blaming Andrea and Rusty for what he said was the inevitable, their family burning in the pits of hell, if only they listened to him. The Warnecki sent a newsletter to Andrea and Rusty titled The Perilous Times. In it is a poem that mourns the disobedient kids of the, quote, mother modern worldly. A Houston psychiatrist, Lucy Perrier, told the jury that this literature was, quote, what her delusions are built around, end of quote. Here's the poem. Modern mother worldly was very, very lazy. All her children drove her crazy. The Bible told her to spank and train them, but society said she must never constrain them. The fruit of rebellion she did now see. On the day of judgment she will have no plea. Modern mother worldly, cast in hell. Now what becomes of the children of such a Jezebel? Prior to her pregnancy, Debbie discouraged Andrea from getting pregnant again. Andrea gave birth to her daughter Mary on November 30th, 2000. In March 2001, Andrea's father died. 
Andrea had been very close to her father. In fact, she had been caring for him for seven years prior, as his health had continuously declined. Within days of his death, Andrea's mental health started to decline rapidly. By the end of March 2001, she began her catatonic behavior, and she would stand or sit without moving or speaking for hours at a time. She had begun to self-mutilate again. This time, she became obsessed with holding her baby Mary, terrified of putting her down. She was hallucinating and had stopped eating and drinking and was only sleeping an hour or two a night. She had stopped speaking altogether. Rusty was frightened and got in touch with Dr. Starbranch. And Dr. Starbranch wanted Andrea to be admitted immediately under her care. But Rusty didn't want to drive the 45 minutes with Andrea and the kids, so he made an appointment at the office for April the 2nd. Rusty tried to get other psychiatrists, who had not even seen Andrea before, to prescribe psychiatric medications over the phone. And of course they did not. On March the 30th, Andrea's brother, who was aware of his sister's rapid decline, arrived at the Yates home and carried Andrea out to the car, and he and Rusty had to force her into it. Thankfully, Brian took the lead on this because Rusty had said, quote, I was thinking, who will take care of these kids? Mary wasn't taking the bottle very well, and I was worried about her. Maybe I was just afraid. End of quote. They went to a lockdown facility called Devereaux, Texas Treatment Network. The facility told Rusty that they couldn't take Andrea until the next day, but Rusty insisted, stating that Andrea couldn't survive another day alone. Andrea refused to sign a consent for treatment. The attending physician, Dr. Albritton, got in touch with the Galveston County Probate Court for an emergency and voluntary admission and treatment. It was approved. Andrea had declined even further the next day. Hospital notes stated that her total nutritional intake for the day was only 16 ounces of liquid. Hospital progress reports established that she could, with great effort, speak three or four word sentences. Her longest sentence was, quote, I am not a good mother, end of quote. Andrea was transferred to the Austin State Hospital so that she could receive more all-around care. Her physical health was as much in decline as her mental health. Andrea was also refusing her medication. She continued to refuse to eat or drink, and Rusty and his mother would spend hours trying to get Andrea to drink one can of nutritional fluid. An updated order from the probate court included the administration of psychoactive medication. While in hospital, Andrea was to attend group therapy, but the only group therapy available was for addiction. There was nothing else for Andrea's type illness. Of course, Andrea did not respond well to this, not only was she in no shape to attend group therapy, what was addiction counseling going to do for a woman with severe postpartum psychosis? A week later on April 8th, there was a slight improvement. She had taken some solid food and denied feeling suicidal. By the 10th, she had slipped back to her worst state. On April the 12th, Andrea was discharged home to attend an outpatient program by Dr. Saeed. Rusty was shocked, but he went along with it. Dr. Saeed had falsely charted in Andrea's chart, quote, She was feeding herself at the time, reporting she felt 90% better, denying suicidal ideas, agreeing to attend PHP, and requesting to be discharged, end of quote. The outpatient program was for chemical dependency. Andrea attended the group session on April the 13th, and the staff running the program said that Andrea was, quote, sad, depressed, withdrawn, and having suicidal feelings according to the staff member, Lynette Hunterman. Andrea never went back and was formally discharged on April the 18th, 2001. Unfortunately, another premature discharge would prove dangerous. Dora Yates, the mother of Rusty, couldn't believe how bad Andrea's mental and physical health was. She was at the house to babysit while Andrea and Rusty went to an appointment with psychiatrist Dr. Saeed. He increased her dose of Effexor, a drug that never worked for Andrea. Rusty asked Dr. Saeed to contact Dr. Starbranch about prescribing her Heldol instead. Heldol was the only drug that seemed to work for Andrea. Heldol is an antipsychotic. It's, it's an old one, but it seems to work very well with people with psychosis. However, Dr. Saeed did not. Instead, over the next two weeks, he continued to increase her dose of Effexor and maintain the Welbutrin and Respertol doses. Andrea continued to be in a precarious, stable condition, although still very poor. And you guys have to understand, the cocktail that she was on was so strong and so toxic, it's, it's unbelievable. Effexor, Welbutrin, and Respertol. And 
none of these are antipsychotics, so there's no way that they could help her with her condition. By May the 3rd, Andrea started to go down even further. She entered into a catatonic-like state that she had been in in previous instances, forgetting to feed the children, staring off into space and pacing for hours. She had only the minimal interaction with her children, and she was withdrawn and did not speak. She had entered that dangerous zombie-like state again. During this time, Noah had told his maternal grandmother that his mom had filled a bathtub full of water. Heartbreakingly, he told his grandma because his mom never used that bathroom, and he was worried that she would hurt herself, like she had done when she cut her throat, like she did at his grandmother's house. He knew his mom was sick again, and he was scared. When Andrea's mother asked why she filled the bathtub, she said, with monosyllabic words, quote, in case I need it, end of quote. Andrea had an appointment to visit Dr. Saeed on May the 3rd. This is what he wrote in his doctor's notes about Andrea's condition. Quote, the patient was near catatonic, sat in the chair and did not move at all, end of quote. Andrea was admitted to the Devereaux Hospital that day. Devereaux was not a good hospital, but it was the only one that Rusty could afford. This is a quote from the book, Are You There Alone? The Unspeakable Crime of Andrea Yates, written by Susan O'Malley. Quote, Most patients and their families didn't know about the numerous complaints filed against the facility with the Texas Department of Health and Human Services between September 1st, 1996 and August 31st, 1999. And three of the 11 records reviewed, psychosocial evaluations were performed on non-LMSWs and unqualified mental health professionals. In one of eight records, the psychiatric evaluation was missing. In another case, a director failed to monitor the staff. One patient had committed suicide by hanging himself with a bedsheet while on suicide watch, and he had been dead for at least five hours before his body was discovered. End of quote. The medication that Saeed had prescribed had clearly not worked, so he grudgingly decided to try Haldol. He did not discontinue the other medication, he just added the two milligrams of Haldol onto this already toxic cocktail. During Andrea's stay in the hospital, she did not get better, but she did not get worse. If you call being catatonic and completely unable to care for yourself, not any worse. On May the 14th, only 11 days after admission, with no improvement, Andrea was again discharged home. And again, she was to attend the outpatient treatment for addiction. She went to one session. Andrea saw Dr. Saeed one more time in May and twice in June. On the June 4th appointment, Andrea was taken off the Haldol. It was a decision that was made and agreed upon by Dr. Saeed and Rusty. In Andrea's trial, Dr. Saeed testified to this, quote, there was no definite indication of psychosis and that he considered the possibility that Haldol might be hindering the progress, end of quote. Saeed thought this was possibly the case with Andrea and that, quote, we would be able to see more improvement in the depression if we took that measure, end of quote. Andrea spiraled even further into psychosis. She and Rusty saw Dr. Saeed on June the 18th, and Rusty was very worried about Andrea's condition and asked that she be put back on Haldol. Saeed refused and stated that, quote, he did not find any evidence that psychosis was playing any important role. End of quote. He added Remeron, another antidepressant to her toxic cocktail. To add on top of that, she was not on any antipsychotic medication. Saeed reportedly said that, quote, she needed to help out with a more positive attitude. He said to her, chin up. End of quote. On the morning of June 24, 2002, the following phone call was made to 911 from Andrea Yates. This is where I'm going to stop. 
The next and final episode will talk about what led up to the phone call that she made to 911, the court case, and where are they now? Thank you for joining me here today. If you have anything that you want to discuss or add to this case, please feel free to send me an email at www.stattraumapod.com. Please do so on the Facebook group or the Twitter page. I'll put all that information in the show notes. I want to give a special thank you to the wonderful iTunes reviews that I received from Tessa1109, JT Wiggs, Sarah Barra, and Kimmy, Jordan LXR, 123 Fake Street, Caddy Bird, Baker Chris, and Piece of Cake. Thank you guys so much. I love to hear those reviews. I really appreciate it. Also, too, I have brought back my Patreon account to help pay for the expenses of running this podcast, and any support would be really appreciated. All your support is appreciated, whether it's monetary, whether it's reviews, or being on my groups and discussing things, laughing, having fun, what have you. So thank you. I'll put all this stuff in the show notes, and I just want to say thank you so much for joining me here today, and remember to take care of yourself, take care of one another, love each other, and most importantly, love yourself. Peace. One love. True crime and it gets none realer. Sometimes it'll be the cure that'll kill you. Gotta watch out, yeah, you gotta watch your back. Cause you don't wanna be another episode on stat. Thank you for tuning in, learn a thing or two. These medical mysteries can be unbelievable, yeah. Subscribe, make sure you do that so you'll be tuned in and be ready for the next show. Stat.